Recognized internationally for their resplendent gowns and extraordinary quality of work, Colossa are regarded as vanguards of Belle Epoque fashion. They set the standard for elegance at the beginning of the 20th century. In 1916, American Vogue proclaimed Colossa as foremost among the powers that rule the destinies of a woman's life. The enterprise helmed by three sisters became the coveted label for an elite class of women, dressing modern femininity in embroidery and lace. Today Colossa legacy remains understudied, but nonetheless widely recognized and collected. Their designs feature prominently in museum collections worldwide and perform well at auction. As the daughters of a painter and a lace maker, the Colo sisters opened their first shop in Paris in 1879. Their business thrived selling the lace, ribbons, and lingerie that were coveted for the ornately detailed fashions of the era. By 1895, their success and acquired investment by wealthy benefactors led their business to expand into a couture house under the name Colo Sir. The label was operated primarily by the three eldest sisters of the Collo family, Marie Collo Gerber, Marthe Collo Bertrand, and Regina Collo Tennyson Chantrell. Their reputation grew rapidly throughout Paris, and the 1900 Paris Exposition made them known to international clientele. Colossa became a staple in the wardrobes of society women throughout Europe and the United States, helping to usher in a new era of fashion. The Colossa gown may be considered as the epitome of elegance and good taste in this period. Lace tunics enhanced with shimmering embellishments, often worn over an opaque bottom dress layer, were widely accepted by other designer houses and consumers. The label became known for their romantic, highly ornamented creations composed of weightless layers, creating tea gowns and housecoats inspired by the Near and Far East. They abandoned the corset, eschewing the S-curve of the 1890s for a more natural feminine shape. The silhouette favored by Charles Frederick Worth, cinched, padded, and buttressed, dictated the movement and occupation of the female body only a decade prior. Marie Gerber was known among the three as the lead innovator and designer, who, skilled in draping and effortless manipulation of fabric, created dresses less restrictive than Poiret's hobble skirts, and more understated than his theatrical orientalism. After maintaining a thriving business throughout the economic challenges of the First World War, the years following the war brought about a great deal of change for Colossa. This was a time of flux for the fashion industry as customer demands and tastes shifted. In 1920, Marc died and Regine retired, leaving Marie as the sole proprietor and creative force during a time of enormous change for Colossa. Colossa later work reflects the aesthetic revolution underway in fashion, decorative arts, and architecture. During the war, women entered the workforce in unprecedented numbers, enjoying activities and liberties they had previously been denied. The transfigurations that occurred in art were paralleled in fashion, and antiquated bodily ideals were subverted by the straight, almost tubular, figure of the liberated and enfranchised woman. Indeed, Collo experimented with the sleeker lines, harder edges, and flattened forms of modernism, as the taste for ornamentation declined. They began to incorporate elements of art deco and cubism into their romantic, feminine core. Geometric in design, noted Diana Vreeland, the clothes relied on the motion of living women to breathe in a shape, 
a movement and a sexuality into an otherwise sterile form. Madeleine Vianney once a student of Collot's, she later became an influence, and forever remained an admirer, saying, without the example of the Collot sir, I would have continued to make Fords. It is because of them that I have been able to make Rolls Royces, In turn, Gerber began to utilize the bias cut, of which VNA was an early proponent. Richard Martin notes, still of an older order in not eschewing ornament, the Colossa worked ornament subject to the plane. Amplification and accretion were deliberately avoided. Colo is responsible for one of the earliest uses of leather in couture, in a 1925 driving coat, housed in the Fashion Museum, Bath, UK. Marie Gerber died in 1927, the same year this coat was created. Her son took over Colosa following her passing, but, impacted by the American market crash in 1929, the house could not sustain. By 1937, Colo had been fully absorbed by Calvet, a competitive French fashion label. This coat speaks not only to its historical moment, but to this turning point for the house. It marks the dawn of a new age for women and the beginning of the end for Colo Sir. Gerber had, at one point expressed that, the dress is everything that should be part of the woman, not the woman part of the dress. It is this woman first ethos that inspired Colo Sir and which is imbued in their creativity. Created for the lifestyle of a modern woman, it demonstrates an effort to embody the zeitgeist of the late 1920s and marks the end of an era for the three fates of Parisian couture. Thanks for your watching and don't forget to subscribe to hear more. Your Valerie